What's up YouTube, how are you doing today? Chana D, your techno dad here, and in today's video, we're gonna continue on with our home theater basics series, and we're gonna talk about the audio video receiver. That's right, the brains of the operation. And we're gonna get into it right after the jump. And I'm back. Now before we begin, if you're new to the channel and you like this kind of content, you should consider subscribing and don't forget to hit the bell notification so you don't miss a beat. Now that that's out of the way, let's get into it. Now I know I haven't done one of these videos in a little while. I was just kind of figuring out what order I should make the videos in to make it like logical for you guys watching at home. So I figured might as well go with the AV receiver or the audio video receiver or the AVR these all mean the same thing. And basically what it is, is the hub of your home theater setup. Okay, it's a big box, lots of inputs, and volume, and all this kind of nonsense. Room correction, all this stuff, we're gonna get into all that. So what the basic, basic idea and principle behind it is, you have all of your sources go into your AV receiver, then from there, it sends out audio output to speakers, and it sends a video output to your display. Let me show you a little diagram here to help illustrate the situation. Now, in this diagram, I have used my setup and gotten the pictures of everything that I have in my setup. So I have a Denon AVR X6300H. It's an 11 channel AV receiver, so it can process and power 11 speakers altogether for a 7.2.4 Dolby Atmos configuration. Now, if you're new to this and don't know what those numbers mean, 5.1, 5.1.2, 7.2.4, 1 whatever the numbers are, if you don't know what that means, I'll put a link to a card here that'll take you to a video I made a little while back that explains all that for you. So in the center, I have my Denon AVR. Now at the very bottom here of the diagram, I've got five sources. Now these are all audio and video sources, okay? I've got a 4K UHD player, that's the OPPO 203. I've got an Xbox One S. I know it says Xbox One X on the uh, diagram because I will be upgrading. I got one on uh, pre-order, so that's just kind of waiting in the wings. Got a PS4 Pro and got a DirecTV box and a Mac Mini that serves as like a media player. And I have all of those five audio video sources going into the Denon and all of them are coming in via HDMI. Now, from here, the Denon has two outputs, okay? The Denon is sending audio signals through regular speaker wire to my 5.1.2 setup. And that's a Dolby Atmos configuration with two high channels. It's basically your regular 5.1 surround sound system with two high channels. So it's like the smallest bare bones Dolby Atmos DTSX configuration you can have. Audio is being sent out from the Denon to all the speakers. And then video is sent from the Denon to my display, which is a 65 inch E6 OLED. So I'm using this diagram to illustrate the fact that the AV receiver is your central hub of all your electronics. So why do we call it an audio video receiver? Basically, it's a box where you connect all your audio video sources to, it outputs audio to speakers, video to a display, and it decodes all of the different types of surround sound. You've got Dolby Digital, Dolby True HD, Dolby Atmos, DTS, DTS Master Audio, and DTS X, just to name a few. I know there's a lot more, but those are the ones you know that are kinda in the forefront of all this going on right now. So, it processes all that stuff, okay? along with being the hub of the electronics, okay? It also powers your speakers. So there is an amplifier in the AV receiver that powers all of your speakers. So it also does that. Now there is a different type of setup called separates. And what that does is it separates with the one box into two boxes. Here's another diagram. So instead of having the AV receiver, you have a preamp processor where you plug in all your sources and that box also takes care of all the processing, volume levels, and all that kind of nonsense. Then you connect to a power amplifier, a separate power amplifier, 
via RCA or XLR connections, depending on what kind of preamp processor you have, you'll have one of those two connections. Then from that amplifier, that goes directly to the speakers. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, usually when you have a, a one box that does everything, it'll do everything well, but it won't excel at certain things. And one of the things you definitely want to keep an eye on is interference from your electronics with the amplification, which is also why separates cost a lot more. You're gonna have a power amplifier that's delivering a lot of power to your speakers, and it's gonna be separate from the processor. That's pretty much what separates are. And you can even run multiple amplifiers. It all depends on how many speakers you have and how much money you wanna spend, because this stuff isn't cheap. So the next thing we need to look at in our AV receiver is connectivity. How many sources are you gonna to need to hook up? In my example, I have five sources. I've got Xbox, PlayStation, DirecTV, uh, 4K player, and a Mac mini. So that's five sources and they're all coming in through HDMI. So at the very minimum, I probably want an AVR that's got five, maybe six HDMI inputs on the back. Now usually when you go up to like past the $500 mark, you'll get an AV receiver that has an HDMI input on the front as well. Depending on if you wanna use that or not, I don't know, that's up to you. So for the most part, you wanna make sure you have enough inputs for what you have now and maybe one or maybe two on the rear end of the AVR just so that you can kind of grow into it or if you do decide to buy like an Apple TV 4K, you can pop that in or a Roku device, you can pop that in. It's always good to have little extra than what you're currently using. And that just goes for HDMI. Now you wanna make sure that your AV receiver can also take RCA connections, the old school ones like the red, white, yellow, you know what I'm talking about, or even component HD. These are also connections that really depend on what your sources are. If you have a lot of newer equipment, chances are it's mostly HDMI. But if you have equipment that's older, what they call legacy equipment, then you'll definitely wanna take a look at that. Now, the one thing you need to do with all these HDMI ports, you need to make sure that they all support 4K 60 frames per second. They all support HDCP 2.2, BT 2020, and they're all HDMI 2.0. It's gonna be important that all the HDMI inputs across the board on this AVR have all those specifications. And if you're watching this now and saying, well, there's gonna be a new HDMI spec coming out and all these things are gonna be obsolete, I'll be addressing that at the end of the video. So you guys can like fast forward to that if you wanna know my thoughts on that or just kinda of like wait. Now, as far as outputs, you do wanna make sure that your AVR has pre-outs. A pre-out takes an audio signal that's meant for a certain speaker, let's say the left front or the right front speaker, as an RCA usually, and plug that into an external amplifier, like we talked about earlier, separates, and that powers the speakers. But you definitely wanna make sure you have two subwoofer preouts. Most of the new audio video receivers these days will support a dual sub configuration. So you wanna make sure on the back of it, you can clearly see subwoofer one, subwoofer two. They are gonna be RCA connections. So these are some things connectivity wise, you wanna take into consideration when you're looking at AVRs to purchase. And since we just touched on power, let's talk about it, shall we? Power ratings on AV receivers are totally whacked out, okay? You will not know how much power this receiver is actually putting out to your speakers, and it's kinda messed up. There really is no standardization among brands, and they tell you it in so many different ways. Now for my Denon, it says 140 watts per channel into eight ohms, two channels driven. So what does that mean? That means if my speakers have an impedance of eight ohms, then the Denon will send 140 watts to those speakers. But it'll only send 140 watts to two speakers. Wait, but it can power 11. 11, not two. So what does that mean? That means when I'm sitting there listening to two channel music on my big Klipsch towers, I'm getting 140 watts per channel to those two channels. 
but I have a 5.1.2 setup. That means I have seven speakers that I'm powering. So now we just kind of have to like figure out, well, is it dividing, is, is the AVR dividing up all that power into seven speakers? Probably, maybe a little bit more, maybe it has a little more, I don't know. That's the thing about power ratings on these receivers. And I was poking around, some of them give you the power wattage in four ohms instead of eight ohms. So you're gonna have to dig around and find out and kind of make sense of what power rating they're telling you is gonna work with whatever speakers, you know? And so if you're trying to like match up, you know, AV receivers to speakers, like we can make a whole nother video on that. And I probably will at some point down the line, but it is kind of confusing and kind of annoying. Like, can you just tell me how many Watts per channel for all 11 channels that this receiver can do? No, they don't tell you that. They don't tell you that. I wonder why. Probably gonna be like 20 watts a channel <laughs> or something like that. So that's one of the things that really is kind of annoying about buying an AV receiver and trying to figure out which one to buy because the power ratings don't have any kind of standardization. So let's say you have a situation where you're looking at you know receiver A and receiver B and everything's pretty much the same. One has a little bit more power than the other, but you like the other one because it has more HDMI inputs, go with the one with the HDMI inputs and the lower power rating because you really don't know. The one with the higher power rating might not actually put out as much power as the one with the lower power rating yet has more HDMI inputs. It's kind of like a little dance, you know? So you kind of have to like balance like what you're gonna pay for and if you really need the more connectivity and going down a little bit in power, might not be a bad idea because we really don't know how much power these things are actually putting out in a home theater setup where you have like five or more speakers plugged into the amp because all of their ratings are based on two channels driven. So now let's say you got your AV receiver, you got your speakers plugged in, you got them all set up around the room and everything on the ceiling, all that cool stuff, subwoofers in the corner, you're making your wife or significant other really pissed off that you got all these speakers and wires in the room and you're just like, oh, let's turn it on. Stop. You still have another step in this process and that's room correction, okay? Now a lot of AV receivers have built in room correction. I have a Denon and Denon and Marantz are owned by the same company so they both use Odyssey. Now the Odyssey room correction is different in the $300 receivers as compared to the like $2,000 ones. You're going to get different levels of room correction software depending on how much you pay for your receiver. So the Odyssey Multi EQ32 XT or I don't know something like that is what's in my Denon, I'm not 100% sure, but it's better than the Odyssey room correction that comes in the $300 Denon. And that's just the way it goes. Now each manufacturer has different types of room correction. So like I stated before, Denon Marantz use Odyssey. Onkyo uses AccuEQ speaker calibration. Yamaha uses YPAO, Yamaha Parametric Room Acoustic Optimizer. That's a mouthful. Sony uses digital cinema audio correction. Anthem uses a proprietary ARC, Anthem room correction. Simple, simple. And the company NAD uses Dirac live room correction suite. So they all kind of do the same thing. Now in a perfect world, it'd be awesome to have a perfectly rectangular room to put in your home theater. I have all my stuff in the living room, which and it's kind of messed up because it's not like a rectangle and things are off a little bit and I have vaulted ceilings and it's kind of a mess audio wise. And the room correction will get your system to the best like sound possible even with all the imperfections in your room. Now I know a bunch of people are going to jump down my throat and say you shouldn't use auto room correction. You should sit there and measure everything. So. Let me break it down for the people that don't know. And if you are new to this, just use the auto room correction. Basically what it breaks down to is you get a microphone with your AV receiver. Okay. And you get like a, you need a tripod or something like that. And you plug in the microphone to the front usually of the AV receiver 
and then if you follow like the on-screen directions it'll tell you where to place the microphone into like different um, areas of your seating position i know with odyssey there are eight different positions where you need to have the microphone for it to get the right kind of calibration and once you put the microphone in the first spot you hit start and it plays like pink noise which is just static you know out of like the left channel then it'll go to the center then to the right surround left surround right add most left add most right and then subwoofer and then you move the microphone to the second location and then it runs all that again and you do all that and it's very time consuming on some of these higher end AV receivers and if you have like an 11 speaker setup then you know and like five locations at the minimum you're doing 55 different tests that's a lot of time so that's what the room correction does and that's the way it does it now what it does is it's collecting data from that certain speaker and like measuring how far away that speaker is from the microphone in that specific position so then the receiver kind of takes in all that data and calculates it and you know puts in the distances for each speaker and then changes the respective volume so that you can get an even sound all the way around now you can do this by sitting there in one position with a decibel meter and with like some sort of measuring tape or whatever. Now that does sound like a pain in the butt. However, that's how they did it back in the day and a lot of people out there still do that. But I use auto room correction. I love it. I don't have to deal with it. I got too many other things to do than sit there and measure speakers. Anyway, so that kind of wraps up what the room correction software does. So now you've kind of got a basic idea of what an AV receiver does. Now, like I said before, the amount of money you pay really depends on all the features that you're gonna get. Now with a $500 receiver, maybe you'll have seven powered channels for Atmos and that's pretty much it. So you have a 5.2.2, whereas if you go up to like 14, 15, $1,600, you'll get you know, a nine channel process and power or 11 channel processor and power like I have. It all really depends on how much money you want to spend and what's in your budget. Now, if you're new to this game, here's the thing. You got to pay to play. That's the first thing. And the second thing is the technology is going to change. I know I mentioned it earlier in the video about HDMI 2.1 or HDMI 3.0 or whatever they're going to change it to. That's not really decided yet. It's not out yet. Maybe we'll see it in 2018. We don't know. So you could think about it in this way. Go down to like a $500 AV receiver and spend more money on your speakers because speaker technology doesn't really change. Speakers are speakers. And the more you spend on your speakers, the better sound's gonna be as well. And they're gonna last a lot longer than your AV receiver. I've had speakers, I've had a 5.1 speaker setup since 2005 and gone through three receivers. That's just the kind of way it goes you know and that was over the span of like i don't know 15 16 years so the speakers are fine they work well they sound great things are just changing on the technology front hdmi had to change it out then there was 4k had to change it out you know th these are the kinds of things that you have no idea about whatever's going to happen in the future as far as technology is concerned so you may really like that $2,000 AV receiver, but maybe you don't want to spend that much because you don't know what's coming down the pike and maybe you just kind of want to spend a little less on that and more on your speakers because, let's face it, your speakers are going to last a long time. So that brings me to this point. What I figured and what I like and the way I think about how my setup was and what I wanted to do with it is this. In 2016, I bought my AV receiver at the very end. And in 2017, I've been living with it and it's pretty awesome, loving it so far. Wish it had a little bit more juice, like power. I, I might add a power amplifier, whatever. But here's the thing. This technology is gonna change at some point in time, maybe a year from now, maybe two years from now, maybe three years from now, we don't know. So the best thing to do or my best advice to give to you is, boom, take a stand. I'm buying this now. I'm living with this for the next five to 10 years. I don't care what's coming down. 
I don't care about 8K. I don't care about 12K. I don't care about Dolby Atmos 10.6.35. I don't care. You, you got to just like take a stand and say, that's it. I'm buying right now. What's the best my money can buy right now? I'm going to get a 4K TV with HDR. I'm going to get a 4K Blu-ray player. I'm going to get an AV receiver. I'm going to get a 5.2.2 Atmos setup, and I'm going to rock that. I'm going to rock that for like five to eight, ten years. And then when you get down the line and you've seen the changes and you've seen all the early adopters fumble through all of the nonsense that you didn't have to, then in like eight years, ten years from now, you're going to be like, okay, let's upgrade the system. Let's sell all this stuff off and let's upgrade the system now. So that's kind of like the best advice I have for any of you looking to jump into home theater, especially now with all the 4K stuff, um, you know, HDR and all this kind of nonsense going on. You either take a stand now and not worry what's coming up in two years, not worry what's coming up in three years or even five years. Wait till what's happening eight years from now. Worry about it then. Buy the best that you can now and rock it. Rock it. Rock it hardcore. That's my advice to you because Electronics and technology will always change. Content will always be lagging behind all the changes that are always happening throughout the years. That's my little editorial advice for you guys at home. And I guess that kind of wraps it up for this video. If you liked it, go ahead and smash that like button. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel using the button in the middle of your screen. Once again, my name is Chana D. I'm your techno dad, and I'll see you next time.